Well, good evening. Welcome to our May WIP Town Hall, co-hosted by the City of Carlsbad and the Department of Energy. This town hall, like all others, will focus on WIP recovery and is taking place at Carlsbad City Hall, but also being broadcast by Red Rocket Video. We'll have a very special presentation by Cabinet Secretary Ryan Flynn tonight about some of the settlement effort. Joining Secretary Flynn from the New Mexico Environment Department and Resource Protection Division Director, Catherine Roberts, and the General Counsel, Jeff Kendall, along with Dr. Martin Simon. We sincerely appreciate Secretary Flynn and the NMED's efforts in piecing together a settlement related to the permit violations associated with last year's incidents. This settlement is the best resolution in a difficult situation that will use money to protect local communities and better safeguard transportation routes. We appreciate so much how much this settlement was handled, the fact that it does not come out of WIPS operating budget, and the fact that it is going to be used for safety improvements. And we also appreciate is the fact that you have involved us and other affected communities in the state in the discussion. This was a very significant settlement, and the state is to be commended for being tough and focused, but also looking at the big picture. Additionally, I would like to compliment everyone at WIP for successfully isolating the nitrate-bearing waste by completing closure of Room 7, Panel 7, along with the interim closure of Panel 6. This was of the utmost importance. This has been an excellent time for the WIP recovery effort. John Heaton will be our moderator tonight. Our presenters this evening will be Dana Bryson, representing the Department of Energy, and Jim Blankenhorn, representing the Nuclear Waste Partnership. We do have some guests in the audience tonight. We have Beverly Allen Ananis with Senator Udall's office, Diana Ventura with Senator Heinrich's office, Bernadette Granger with Congressman Pierce's office, Andrea Goodbar with NMED, we did have Jay Jenkins, president of CDOD, and Paul Shoemaker with Sandia Labs. And with that, I'll turn things over to John Heaton. And thank, thank you, Mayor. My name is John Heaton, and I will moderate tonight, try to keep all the wild people under control. And uh, but at any rate, I appreciate very much your attendance. And uh, we are also online. So I appreciate everybody that is joined, has joined us uh, on the internet. And uh, we'll do like we usually do. Uh, we'll take questions from the audience here, and then we will move to the questions that are online. Uh, we've just been joined by Representative Brown. Representative Brown, thank you for being here. So. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce Secretary Flynn to make his comments. Uh, just a couple of comments about him. He's, he's, he's tough, he's fair, and I don't think he has a political agenda, which is very refreshing for a Secretary of the Environment. And a couple of weeks ago at the uh, National Transportation Stakeholders Forum. He did the introductory address for the state of New Mexico, and he did an absolutely incredible job of talking about New Mexico and all of its really fascinating and interesting attributes. And in fact, uh, when after he made the made the talk, I thought, you know, he ought to be governor. Uh, he, 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 it was, it was really, really good, and I think he represents the state of New Mexico in a, in a terrific way. So with that, Secretary Flynn, welcome. We're, we're always pleased to have you here. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the compliment. We've got a, I'm happy to carry the bags for our current governor. We've got a pretty good one right now. Um, I want to 
first and foremost thank the community. I, we, we, I came here tonight to talk a little bit about the, the settlement agreement that we were able to obtain, and that was really going to be the focus of my uh, comments. And uh, I've, I've, as you mentioned, I've been joined by Jeff Kendall and Katie Roberts, and I'm going to ask them to, to participate and to, to kind of walk you through the, the agreement that I know you all are familiar with at this point. Um, but I, I first wanted to to just point out the the value of this community in keeping this facility moving forward and in, in keeping this situation under control here. Uh, the input we received from this community was vital to being able to facilitate a settlement agreement here. And I think uh, Jeff Kendall will talk a little bit about that later. But really, I want to just emphasize quite clearly that we listened loud and clear to uh, input and feedback that we received from a variety of different officials and members of the community in thinking about what the best path forward for this facility would be. I'm very conscious of the fact that, that a lot of people in this room and uh, especially in this community uh, worked extremely hard in order to get the WIP facility sited here in New Mexico in order to address a, a very important national security uh, need. There were a lot of henny pennies out there who at the time uh, we were first raising our hand um, said that this facility would never actually be able to be sited in New Mexico and that we wouldn't be able to navigate uh, what are really truly a Kafkaesque kind of set of laws and regulations in order to actually uh, move this project forward. Um, but through the persistence and support of this community, we are able to actually get the whip opened. And while this event, it was serious uh, in that this is the first serious incident we've had, and we were very fortunate that there were no workers in the underground at the time this release did occur. Uh, so I'm, I'm in no way diminishing the, the severity of this incident. I am saying that this incident is a huge opportunity for us to learn from those mistakes and ensure that all the work that's been done to put us in this position to open this facility in order to serve our national interests uh, will be able to continue for the long term. And that's truly the Environment Department uh, and Governor Martinez's goal. We want this facility to be viable for the long term. We, uh, and, and while this was a setback, we are finally beginning to see some real progress. And so I really want to thank the community for all of your support, the, inf the input that you put into this uh, settlement agreement, as well as all the work that the workers at the site have done over the past couple of months. I know there were some difficult times and people were probably, uh, after the immediate issue had uh, been resolved or um, the, the immediate concerns of the public health and safety uh, had gone away, there next was a lot of uncertainty about the future of this facility. And uh, make no mistake, the state is 100% committed to the long-term success of the WIP facility. This facility serves a compelling national interest that no other state has raised their hand to address. And it will be uh, a vital part of our future as a state. And I am extremely proud of being able to work and serve this community uh, over the past couple of years. And I, and I really look forward to working with you going forward. Uh, and, I, and I think we're finally, again, we still have a lot of work to, to uh, go in order to move this facility forward. But I think we're finally beginning to see some progress. And I know there's been a lot of hard work that's been done by men and women who work there. Uh, some of the people in this room have just been amazing in their efforts. And the closure of uh, the, the interim closure of panel six and, and panel seven, room seven, are critical steps forward. And I think you all deserve a lot of credit for really uh, moving, that, moving that project forward. And finally, we're, being, we're finally able to start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Make no mistake, there's a long tunnel ahead of us. But we're really, we're really beginning to make some progress. So I'm very proud of that. I really appreciate all the support in this community. I appreciate uh, John Heaton has been a huge asset uh, throughout this process. Uh, Mayor Janway, Representative Brown, um, and on and on. We've just had such the Eddy County officials, uh, even Lee County. I mean, this entire region has been huge. 
uh, advocates for this facility, and I think we certainly would not have been successful in the past in getting this facility here without the support of the community, and we won't be so we won't be successful moving forward into the future uh, without the support of this community. So I, I thank you all for everything you've done in order to move this forward, and, and it truly, from my perspective, it's really an honor to be able to represent Carlsbad. Carlsbad has heart, and uh, I really, uh, I, there's something about this town that resonates with me in this whole region. People really, they work very hard, they don't take themselves too seriously, uh, and they compete every day, and they're constantly looking for ways to compete as a region. And so I, I, I truly, it is an honor for me to be able to represent this area um, you know, the only criticism I have is your hotel rates are so high, but um, I know you can't, we really can't control that. Um, but in any event, so the way we really want to kind of talk through this, uh, and, and you know, one, one final thing before I turn it over to the rest of the, the, uh, the members of my staff that are here to, to really, who did all the hard work, uh, well, well, two final quick points. One is, you know, this community is unique in your knowledge about these issues. And I, this is, I'm dead serious, this is a true story. I was at a committee meeting uh, a little more than a year ago, and one of our legislators was talking about Yucca Mountain and kind of putting it in the context of the movie Godzilla and talking about all of the work that, um, that the special effects in that movie and why we couldn't do some of the things that they were doing in that movie here in New Mexico. And I, was, I remember after the meeting telling my staff that, like, you know, this is a very different conversation than we have when we're in Carlsbad. Um, we're not really talking about Godzilla and, uh, and Hollywood ideas for how to actually manage waste. We're talking with people who have very strong engineering, scientific backgrounds, uh, people with strong business backgrounds, and it's just, it's a pleasure to be able to come down here because there's such a, a high IQ in this area and a, a, a very strong grasp of the complexity of these issues. And, uh, and so I, I really appreciate just the level of discourse that we get to have here uh, when we're down in Carlsbad. It's, it's, it's not unique in that Los Alamos is also, um, also different in the level of discourse that we have there. Um, but y y between Carlsbad and Los Alamos, uh, these are just really great communities to be able to work with because you are so educated about these facilities and these issues. And so I feel like it's always a pleasure to be here and to talk to you. Um, the last thing I'm going to say before I introduce Jeff to begin and, and kind of walk you through the settlement agreement um, is that my staff, you know, I, I'm, I'm, really pretty, I'm, I'm really grateful for all the kind words I've received and, and uh, certainly Governor Martinez. Uh, Senator Domenici also helped us out on uh, really working to get a resolution here. And uh, he, he's uh, just an incredible man who still serves the state. Uh, even after he left office. Um, really appreciate our congressional delegation support, but most, uh, most importantly, um, you know, my staff, Jeff Kendall, um, you know, did an amazing job. He was in the room the whole time with me. I, I, I really, he was the brains behind this operation. Uh, Katie Roberts, uh, our, our Division Director for Resource Protection Division, um, she was also vital to this process, and our other staff members who worked so hard behind the scenes in order to make sure that we continue to protect the public and continue to make sure these facilities are able to resume operations. And so I'm, uh, when I, I appreciate the credit we get, but I have to give it all to them because truly they are the ones who've done all the work and continue to do all the work. And they're the ones that will make sure this facility is successful moving forward. So with that, I'm gonna ask Jeff to kind of walk you all through settlement agreement. I'm gonna apologize for him. I did our slides, so that's why they're so ugly. Uh, I got rid of all the pictures that were in them uh, previously, so they're really not interesting. So I've really put him in the hole to begin with here. Uh, so I want to you know, make sure I take all the blame for that. But uh, with that, I'll just turn it over to Jeff and ask him if he could kind of walk you through the settlement agreement. And then I was going to ask uh, Katie Roberts to talk through some of the corrective actions that we've been incorporating um, and, and some of the steps that need to be taken in order to move forward to resume operations. So with that, I'll ask Jeff to come up and kind of talk to you a little bit about the settlement agreement. Jeff, thanks. All right. Secretary Flynn, thank you for those kind words and introduction. I want to say at the outset that uh, Ryan is a leader um, who always gives credit to his staff. 
um, being at the New Mexico environment for the past two years, that's something that's um, constantly coming down from the top down, um, down to myself, our legal office, on down to our staff who have worked on this issue. Um, but anybody in this room who knows and has worked with Ryan um, since he became cabinet secretary when he was general counsel before, um, he is a true leader, and without his leadership in all regards, with staff, with the congressional delegation, with the interested stakeholders down here in Carlsbad, we would not be where we are today. We would not be here with this monumental settlement if it weren't for his leadership. So I want to say that at the outset. And as far as the presentation goes, I'm pretty sure Ryan took a look at it this morning and said, I don't think I can do this. I'm going to have to pass it on. <laughs> so there's a lot of words, very few pictures, but I think that's fitting for an attorney. So, um, first off, many of you in the room are aware of essentially the enforcement action the New Mexico Environment Department took um, at the WIP and at Los Alamos in December of 2014. Just to briefly summarize, those enforcement actions which led to this monumental settlement at WIP, we issued fines in the amount of $17.7 million for 13 permit violations. Um, those violations include failure to timely notify the New Mexico Environment Department of the release and the, the Im improper acceptance and disposal, disposal of incompatible and ignitable waste. Now up at Los Alam Alamos, we issued a similar order for $36.6 million for 18 permit violations. Those permit violations include treatment of hazardous, uh, improper treatment of hazardous waste without a permit, mixing incompatible waste, failure to properly manage incompatible waste, and the failure to ad adequately characterize the waste. Those were issued in December. Um, response is filed by the parties in January. And we announced this settlement in April, on April 30. Um, when these administrative orders were issued, all we heard is, you're never going to see the end of this. This is going to be a matter that um, goes beyond this current administration and be tied up in litigation for years. I think the amount of time it took all the interested parties, both the permittees, the respondents, and the New Mexico environment to reach a resolution is really indicative of our commitment to this facility and all the interested stakeholders' commitment to this facility. So we can take pride in that. Okay, so we reached a principles of agreement document that was announced on April 30th. This will lead to a final binding settlement agreement that will be executed hopefully in the next 30 to 60 days. This slide here outlines some highlights of that settlement agreement. And the way you can think about the settlement agreement is it's made up of two key components. One is a, um, a slew of supplemental environmental projects. And two, corrective actions at both facilities. Doing supplemental environmental projects is an avenue we chose to pursue, along with the respondents, it's directly in response to much of the input we received from the communities. The next couple slides will outline some of the resolutions that came from this community and also Los Alamos about using supplemental environmental projects to make sure the monies paid as a result of these violations get reinvested back in these communities, which is a very important win with this settlement agreement. Cumulatively, the supplemental environmental projects are worth $73.25 million. And a key for that $73.25 million is this is money that's already been appropriated. There were issues about whether or not we could have a settlement agreement with monies being paid and whether or not we would need congressional approval. DOE stepped up in a big way, found money to make the state whole so that we can move forward with the mission of the WIP. So first off, um, we have listed there in this list supplemental environmental projects for Carlsbad and also for Los Alamos. First there, we have $34 million that's going to be invested in whip transportation routes in southeastern New Mexico. Similar to that, we have $12 million that DOE has dedicated to improving the transportation routes in and around Los Alamos. Now, when we talk about those steps, they're obviously the largest dollar amount of the cumulative to total. And um, there's a reason for that. <clears throat> when it comes to safe operations at WIP, there's nothing less important than the safe transportation of these drums to the facility. When the WIP opened, as many of you know, there was a grant agreement that was entered into that provided $300 million over 15 years. That expired in 2012. And since then, 
we've been facing numerous issues related to the degradation of roads, especially the roads here in District 2 in the southeastern portion of the state. Um, the one thing about dealing with roads, we've seen this play out in the past legislative session. We have a special session, hopefully upcoming, that's related to what roads will get funding, where will the money come from. Well, in this context, we had the luxury of we have technical experts at the New Mexico Department of Transportation who stepped up in a big way and were able to identify the most explicit needs statewide for road improvements. So the discussion wasn't a political discussion about which roads would get funded in which political districts. It was truly based on need. And I think that was one of the key reasons New Mexico Department of Transportation and Tom Church and his staff stepping up, meeting with DOE, with Secretary Flynn and myself in Washington to make a um, legitimate, non-politicized case for which roads need to be improved and why it is so vital to the future of the WIP. So a huge win for this community, all of southeastern New Mexico, and all of the whole DOE complex when you think about these different generator sites that have to use our roads to transport their transuranic waste to WIP. Thirdly listed on there is a set for Los Alamos. DOE is committed to $10 million for replacing aging potable water lines in and around Los Alamos. Um, that's particularly big. We've obviously had a huge focus on water infrastructure and water quality in and around Los Alamos area. That is a key step that will help to serve that uh, commitment from our agency and others. The next supplemental envi environmental project is also for Los Alamos. It also relates to water. We're going to build 9.5, take $9.5 million and build engineering structures. We'll increase monitoring capabilities in and around LANL in order to manage stormwater flows. It's a big issue for our Surface Water Quality Bureau, DOE Oversight Bureau. As those sediment loads shift, the geography shifts, and with floods, recurring floods and fire issues, it's a huge issue. So for DOE to step up and dedicate that kind of money to an effort like that, it will benefit the Los Alamos community and also the neighboring communities, including the Pueblos. The next step relates to um, Carlsbad and the WIP, and it's actually the set that we anticipate will be done, will at least get working on the soonest, which is big for this community. DOE has stepped up and committed to do $5 million to construct an emergency operations center in Carlsbad and provide enhanced training to first responders of mine rescue teams. This will serve to um, benefit the entire mining community in this region. And I think of all the things, the contractor, DOE, citizens have learned from this event is that how you respond is key. The first AIB report and the second AIB report, you know, focus on certain response issues that occurred. And we think that invest, investing in infrastructure like this and placing qualified personnel to handle situations should it occur is a great investment in this community for the long term. The last set mentioned on there is $2.75 million dollars to fund an independent triennial compliance and operational review. This SEP fits directly within our penalty policy we implement at the New Mexico Environment Department, along with the rest of the SEPs. This one in particular um, has drawn some criticism publicly. Secretary Flynn addressed this before an uh, interim committee this week. But this SEP is indicative of the approach we take at the New Mexico Environment Department. We focus on compliance getting regulated entities to comply, not to run up a bill for violations of a permit. And this will get to the heart of that. The goal is to do triennial review every three years at WIP, at Los Alamos, of regulatory, regulatory compliance across environmental media and also operational compliance. The other great thing about the independent triennial review is it dovetails with the community input that we're receiving from Carlsbad from the CAP team that wants this transparent mechanism to have an audit done of the facility. Um, that audit would be made publicly available and made available to the Mexico Environment Department so there can be a community assurances in everything across these facilities, uh, particularly as it relates to um, infrastructure that might be aging and using that audit to potentially 
ensure that there's continued safe operations um, at WIP and at Los Alamos. So we're very excited about the triennial review, and um, we think DOE stepping up and committing to this is a, is a big commitment from DOE, and um, we're very pleased with it. So that first bullet there on the next slide, corrective action, Ms. Roberts will come up and address that at the end. So I'll skip that for now. Um, as mentioned by the mayor, and this is a key, key component of the settlement. The funds that will, um, the monies that will fund these SEPs are not going to come out of cleanup budget at either site or an operational budget. If you go back to January and February, some of the positions being taken by DOE headquarters, that was very much not the tenor being played out. Um, I think our team, Secretary Flynn in particular, responded appropriately. They heard from the communities in Carlsbad, in Los Alamos, throughout the state that the, the communities where the facilities exist should not be hurt by diverting budget from those particular facilities. To so get them to commit to that was a huge, huge uh, emphasis for us throughout the entire process. And we're very excited that they were able to stay, step up and make the state whole um, by committing to doing this. So the last side here focuses on the input we received from the host communities. There were several resolutions and recommendations passed by the Citizens Advisory Board in Northern New Mexico the Carlsbad Mayor's Nuclear Task Force, the Regional Coalition of Lionel Communities, which Secretary Flynn and myself traveled to D.C. with for a week, and also state and local officials. Um, cumulatively, those resolutions and feedback we were receiving from the communities focus on three things. That the DOE should enter into good faith negotiations with the state, engage the state and make the state whole to get the whip back on track, that we should utilize SEPs, which we did, which would allow us and DOE to dictate where these monies would actually get spent back in the communities versus getting lost in the wash of a general fund. And thirdly, in those resolutions, numerous statements that money should not come out of cleanup or operational budgets. With this settlement, we were able to achieve all three of those goals. And without the support of the communities, as Secretary Flynn said at the outset, uh, we would not, would not have been able to get there. It was very, very effective when we came to the table to present those um, and express the, the tenor and tone that was coming from the local communities that house these facilities who stepped up. Um, and the last thing I thought it's important to say, and Secretary Flynn sort of hinted at this, you know, throughout this process, whether it was the contractors here at WIP or the uh, CBFO f facility or the community here in Carlsbad, Los Alamos, elsewhere, for this to come to fruition, everybody had to do their job. Secretary Flynn did his job of pushing the right buttons along with our enemy D team. Our staff did their jobs in preparing, doing all the due diligence on permit violations. And the communities getting out and having their voices heard really did play an important role. All of those efforts came to fruition and DOE engaged at the absolute highest level. So as we work forward towards this final settlement agreement, I think everybody here um, should really pat themselves on the back that with this settlement agreement, we've ensured a future for the WIP, a viable facility that can continue to serve the needs of the whole DOE complex. So with that, I'll turn it over to Director Roberts. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna be actually very, very brief. Um, so the secretary and, and Jeff are far more eloquent than I am um, up at a microphone. So, uh, but I did wanna speak just a little bit about some of the corrective actions. Um, one thing that's really important to note um, and make a very clear distinction about are, you know, corrective actions, it's a very broad term, right? And that's, that term is being thrown around quite a bit. Um, in this instance, there are corrective actions that are related to the AIB reports. There are also corrective actions that we, NMED, want to see implemented. So I'm really going to be speaking about corrective actions and very, very high level um, uh, of what NMED wants to see done here. I'm not going to be talking about what 
you know, DOE has decided needs to be done um, with regard to implementing corrective actions for the AIB reports. Um, I think, you know, one in, other, other really important thing to note is that we've been working very closely with the facility. Um, the folks on the ground here at CBFO and NWP are really wonderful to work with. They're very open, they're very transparent, and so we really appreciate all of their efforts um, in, in that area. So, you know, one area that uh, we saw needed great, a, a lot of improvement were procedures, especially related to inspections and emergency equipment in the underground. So the facility has and is still, but they're nearly there, actually modifying any and all procedures related to both of those areas. Um, they've actually proposed modifications to the RECRA permit to in clearly indicate locations and types of emergency equipment. Uh, so emergency equipment is something that's very specifically called out in the permit, and so any inconsistencies that were there previously, they're now being addressed, and those permit modifications are coming in um, very shortly. Uh, I think another key piece, uh, at least from, from my perspective, uh, was the training plan. So training plan for RECRA operators, waste handlers at the facility. So the training plan for those workers is currently being modified. Uh, it will be modified in the permit. Um, they've actually increased the number of live drills and exercises, which is a, is a huge difference. You know, it's one thing to have the theoretical procedure, this is what I have to follow if an event occurs, but now they're actually doing live action responses and those workers, should another event occur in the future, hopefully that will not happen, but they will certainly be prepared to deal with that. So that's just kind of a high level, so procedures, training plans uh, for all of the, uh, the waste handling workers. Those are just kind of to give you a general sense of some of the corrective actions that are being implemented right now and then into the future. So with that, I will turn it back over to Secretary Flynn to make any closing remarks. But <laughs> you're good, or answer any questions. Before we get into questions, just to make a couple of comments. One is, the I, I hear it over and over again, and various industries in our part of the state deal with the Environment Department and Mr. Secretary. I want to tell you that all the comments I get back are that your staff is extraordinarily professional. And, and I think it's a really a, a huge compliment to you and to the people on your staff. So we, we get that, I get that comment very frequently. So thank, thank you for that. I think it's very important. The other point is about the complex at large is there, there are fines going on everywhere around the complex uh, for various reasons. And there is this constant concern about the money coming from the project itself to pay the fine, which as everybody knows reduces the capability of the project. And I think that making the this happened, the way it happened, is absolutely extraordinary. You only have to go to a meeting where all of the, all of the communities in every, at every site in the DOE complex are there and hear their comments about what goes on and the fact that this would never become a reality is rather amazing and I, I think the compliment goes to all of you in ma making this happen. So with that, uh, any questions that anybody has? No questions. Yes, Beverly. Hi. I'm Beverly with Senator Tom Udall's office. Um, Beverly with Senator Tom Udall's office. And, um, uh, just if y'all, I don't know how it's going to be decided through, uh, about the rest of the, um, the items for the fines, um, but just to consider the city of Eunice Fire Department, um, we have some of the same uh, 
the waste that we had uh, at uh, WIP at WCS. Eunice Fire Department has to meet certain standards. I know that part of it addressed it because that's on the transportation route, but I know they haven't been able to qualify recently for any of the Department of Justice funds and things like that. Um, but if we can just consider City of Eunice because they are on that route and we do have some waste stored there. The other thing is, um, you know, because Senator Udall is on appropriations and um, chair of the Department of Defense, which oversees this funds, and he fights hard for this. So I don't want to see any duplication of efforts. And I know that here recently, the uh, Eddy County required the Permian Basin uh, Training Center that does mine safety training. It's like a 5,000 feet facility. And so um, if y'all could just consider that, because I would not like to see duplication of efforts. And the WIP team already is, a, is first in the world in mine rescue. So I'm glad that, you know, because they're up to speed that you will be including the rest of the um, mining community involved in that and you know I hope uh, uh, we've got Freeport McMoran over in Silver City and other mines that they could be included as well but I would just hate to see and just kind of curious about that duplication of efforts when we already have uh, they that will be in a county emergency uh, center we've got the one at Fletzy um, that's 30 minutes away that's a high cost for the gov federal government and then also in Hobbs and just how we could maybe just, uh, I don't know how those decisions are going to be made in the future, but um, from the federal point of view, just looking to help um, uh, keep that money uh, where uh, maybe used at the more of the local level instead of reduplicating that effort. That's all. More of a statement than a question. Beverly, I don't know whether you know or not, but WIP has, and, and the other mines in the state have signed agreements with each other to help one another in, in any event that might occur. And of course, WIP being such a, a strong uh, response team, I think is always, always available and always reactive to any of those kind of activities that may occur anywhere in the state, so there's a cross-mining agreement between everyone. Yeah. Yeah, um, hi, I'm at the current Argus. Um, you discussed that this, there's going to be a special ses session to talk about the roads. When were more details about which roads will be Fixed first, which ones, which directions, just overall more details about them should be released. So, thank you. That's a, a good question. The, um, so the, this agreement is totally separate from the, the capital package that we anticipate is, is going to be negotiated in the next couple of days, or that has already been, I guess, negotiated and will be finalized. The governor's team has been fully, I mean, the governor herself and her chief of staff uh, Keith Gardner, we're constantly talking to, to Jeff Kendall and I as we were you know, in these negotiations. So they've been fully participating in these discussions uh, as well as in the negotiations over the capital package. So there will be no duplication for those two funds. For the, the WIP uh, route funding, the $34 million for the for the Southeast Corridor here, uh, the funds will, will primarily, well, first of all, decisions like uh, like Jeff had said regarding which areas will be addressed and the order in which those areas will be addressed, those will be made by, by uh, Secretary Church and the New Mexico Department of Transportation. And so the funding will actually move from the federal government to the New Mexico Department of Transportation for them to utilize in repairs and maintenance. The funds are earmarked for WIP transportation routes in the southern part of the, st in the southeastern part of the state, District 2. On the, if I had a, if I had a map, if I did a better job giving you a nice PowerPoint, I could show you the District Two section of the map. There you go, right there. Um, but primarily, it's uh, 285 and 62 180. Um, and and the, for with respect to 285, that's the kind of primary artery here. And I and I would anticipate based on the feedback, you know, Jeff and I have received a lot of information from Secretary Church, and he actually participated in some of these discussions as well. 
that that's where the bulk of the work in the southeastern corridor will occur, uh, especially from uh, south of Carl, uh, south of Artesia on 285 is where uh, the Department of Transportation has identified have the greatest needs now. We have huge uh, infrastructure needs, especially for roads throughout the entire state. And uh, one of the things that became clear to me um, based on a conversation with Secretary Church is that this area um, and your representatives have done a very good job advocating for you all while you've uh, while you know, while they were up in the in New Mexico, um, Representative Brown, uh, certainly Senator Lavelle, um, and you know all of your local legislators did a, a very good job of articulating the needs, and they're not uh, exaggerating. You all drive the roads every day. You understand the pounding they take from all the vehicle traffic occurring. Um, so there there are needs throughout the state. This area in particular has some has a lot of stress because of all the activity down here. And so 285 in particular is an area. The route, the access route. Um, from 62 180 to the WIP facility itself, that's also a major priority uh, in in terms of needing upgrades and, and maintenance. Uh, so, but otherwise, really, decisions will be made based on uh, on need, and that's 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 really been the approach we've taken throughout this process. We really, like like uh, Jeff Kendall said, we, we really you know, our approach is not to kind of to to make a to to seek a political win. Um, we really want to really address the needs and make the community and these facilities stronger. So that, that was really our goal throughout these discussions. And roads have a direct health and safety impact related to the facility and the violations. And, that, and so it's not like we pulled roads. There, were, there was no kind of premeditation that we're going to do roads and we're going to get them through these settlement discussions. We really sat down and looked at what are the greatest risks and what are the greatest public safety needs. And roads became kind of the most obvious area where we really needed to make some strategic investments to maintain the WIP uh, facility in the state. And uh, the, I'm not, I think I'm speaking in, of risk relatively, but the transportation of the waste is, is really the highest uh, risk in this entire endeavor because we have uh, the least amount of control over waste as it's being transported, whereas when it's being stored on site, we can really guarantee, uh, not guarantee, but we can uh, provide the maximum level of safety and predict kind of what the threats are, whereas on the road, there's just there's more variables beyond our control. I'm not saying it's, it's posing a huge risk, but I'm saying that, relatively speaking, that's probably the highest risk part of this endeavor. And so it just became very obvious to us as we were talking to the community and we were looking at what would be the make the most sense for supplemental environmental projects, that was a really good place to start. Um, the only thing I would mention is that, you know, one thing that is not part of the settlement agreement that um, that was tough. You know, I didn't get we didn't get everything we wanted. We we, we were able to to get seventy three million dollars of environmental projects for fifty four million dollars of fines. So we were able to accomplish a lot. Um, we certainly there was give and take. The department really stepped up. The department manager really stepped up to work with us. Um, one issue that is still out there that, that we need to address is, you know, CMERC is a is a vital part of this enterprise. Um, Dr. Hardy, staff at CMERC, uh, have done and will continue to do an outstanding job. They have needs that need to be addressed, and so. Um, the state and the federal government, we really need to figure out a way to work together in order to continue to ensure that the, you know, the Carlsbad Envir Environmental Monitoring Research Center continues to have adequate funding so that it can, it can do its job because it's critical to this facility. They've done an outstanding job. Um, we, I would have liked to have seen a supplemental environmental project that was specifically tailored for CMERC, and that was probably the only thing that, that didn't um, – that, that wasn't in this final agreement that, um, that I otherwise would have liked to have seen. Um, but, you know, again, we got $73 million of projects for $54 million of fines, so I think it, it certainly is a fair agreement and, and we, um, you know, and, and money is limited. The, the federal government, at least DOE doesn't print money. There's other, I guess the Treasury does, but DOE doesn't, so uh, thank you. I might say to the, the group on next Tuesday, uh, we're going to invite Dave Set. We've invited Dave Seppich to come to our meeting, who is on the Transportation Commission. He's one of the members, the five members, and he's going to uh, try to 
try to tell the, the mayor's task force about where the priorities are and and what how the transportation department looks at it. They've done an awful lot of analysis across the state and they know where the needs are from their perspective. And uh, one of the discussion points might be about weight versus versus uh, uh, the number of miles traveled, uh, lane miles traveled. Uh, talk about weight uh, on the on the miles traveled a little bit more because we have so much truck traffic and it's so destructive. And so, taking a little different view of how we we interpret the wear and tear on the highway. So, you, it might be interesting. Uh, just to let you know that at that we're going to have a little bit of a discussion about that. I think when I read in the agreement that there was some desire to have input from the area about about what was most needed. But you know you've got to put the money together with the with the, with the needs and figure out what the state's going to do and what we could do in addition to that. So uh, hopefully that will be part of that discussion. Real quick, the, so the, the original grant agreement that was a 15-year, $300 million grant agreement to maintain whip transportation routes, as uh, Jeff Kendall mentioned, expired at the end of 2012. The Department of Energy and the state have agreed to work together in good faith to go back to Congress, and we'll certainly be uh, continuing to talk with our congressional delegation to try to see if we can uh, to get that agreement or something similar to that agreement renewed going forward. Uh, because while these, you know, $46 million for roads, for whip transportation routes is, is great for the state and will certainly help, the annual costs of maintaining the whip routes alone uh, are, are a little over $49 million. And so this money will allow us to use the money that is currently available for roads in other places. So the, they, the, the needs on 285 are identified. The state will be able to use money that the Department of Transportation was, was planning to use for 285. They'll now be able to use that money and help spread that money elsewhere um, in, on other routes in this area that are not, um, that, that, that aren't 285, but also need repair and, and throughout the state. So we're able to extend the, the small pot that we do have further as a result of getting this, this injection of, of money for whip transportation routes. But like I said, the Department of Transportation uh, they, their um, cost assessment says it's going to be, it costs about $49 million to adequately maintain the whip transportation routes in the state of New Mexico. And so one thing that is very positive is that the Department of Energy has agreed to work with the state to go back to Congress to request uh, some sort of renewal. Now we don't, we haven't agreed on what, what that would exactly look like, but we have agreed to work together. And, and previously um, that was not something that, uh, that the Department of Energy was, was, was willing to do. Um, but I think Secretary Church and the state was able to really, we showed, we brought a lot of pictures and showed what the true needs are. And I think we were able to make a compelling case. And certainly, again, you know, Secretary Moniz, um, he, he really, uh, he and his chief of staff, Kevin Knobloch, and, the, and their senior officials, you know, they, they really, rose to the occasion and said, this is important, we need to, New Mexico is critical to the weapons complex, it's, it's criti critical to the nation, and we absolutely have to work with you. And I think once the sides were able to see that really this isn't about politics, this is about really doing what's best for the facilities, doing what's best for the nation, we were able to quickly start moving and making some agreements. And that agreement to really listen to each other, to understand some of the needs like, like roads, really allowed us to move forward. And that will be big as we move forward the next year or two, going back to Congress and trying to get that money restored because this will help right now, but these needs are not going away. And, uh, and I hope they won't go away because the more, you know, the more we're banging up the roads, the more business we're doing down here. And, uh, and that's a good thing, but we, ha we, ha we can't, uh, we can't have an economy that's going to thrive without a sound foundation. So, um, so that's a good detail that is in our agreement, the principles of agreement, but hasn't gotten a lot of attention, that, that mutual agreement to go back to Congress to work on roads. That's something that I don't think people have really uh, understood or, or talked about, but it's, it's a huge step forward, and it's something that previously the Department of Energy was unwilling to agree upon. So thanks. 
way, ba way back when, when this was all, when it expired, OMB had agreed that the, uh, the law that provided the money uh, within it, it would allow an extension of that. So maybe that's an argument as well. So thank you all. Thank you very much for being here and making your presentation. We, we really always appreciate your, your attendance in Carlsbad, and, and uh, the comments were very, very good. Thank you. So we'll, we'll move on. So Dana, Mr. Bryson. Thank you, John. Thank you. So resolution of the settlement agreement is very significant, but now I'd like to segue you to WIP recovery progress. And we've made significant progress on the work scope with that. Uh, panel closure has been completed. You've probably seen the press release that we put out. Uh, room 7, panel 7 was recently closed, which complemented what we'd done with interim closure on uh, panel 6. Interim ventilation system, we've been receiving equipment there. Uh, we have some quality concerns with what we've received, but our process has caught those and we're addressing them. Uh, zone recovery progress has been significant. Uh, we're continuing the decontamination of the underground and we're seeing continued progress on bolting ground control, combustible material reduction, and general underground safety. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jim to talk about the details in these areas. Thank you, Dana. All right, what'd you do to the pointer? Are you playing with it back there? <laughs> Who's driving? All right. Give it back to me. Okay, great. Okay, uh, I want to first talk about some of the uh, some of the significant things that have occurred since we last met. Uh, first, I know Ryan's mentioned it, Dana's mentioned it, but uh, but I want to hit it hard on this slide. Uh, we, we've talked several months about all the prereq uh, activities that we needed to do in order to be able to to do the interim closure on panel six. <laughs> and room seven, panel seven. Things like doing the radiological rollbacks and the surveys, uh, things like ground control and bolting that we needed to perform to gain access, returning the waste hoist back to service, uh, and then finally getting the equipment back into service one piece at a time uh, and manipulating and, and uh, reestablishing the ventilation in the areas where we needed it to be able to perform the work. So we were able to accomplish all that, and on April 4th, we completed the uh, interim closure on panel six, and then uh, this past weekend on May 29th, we, uh, we completed the interim closure of, of room seven, panel seven. Uh, so that effectively now isolates all the suspect nitrate salt containers of concern that were disposed in the, in the WIP underground, uh, and that protects not only our employees, but, uh, but it also protects the, uh, the public and the environment. So significant accomplishments. Uh, these, just as a reminder to everybody, these were items that uh, NMED directed us uh, to perform, and, uh, and I'm proud to say that we, we've gotten it done, and, uh, and I think as a result of that, the underground is, is significantly safer. So appreciate all the help and support in making this a priority. Uh, in regards to ground control, you know, we put this slide up uh, just about every month now, and, and we do it because we want to continue to show you the progress that we're making. The areas in green are the areas where we have uh, completed the catch-up bolting. Uh, the areas in orange and the, and the hashed, hashed orange areas are still areas where we need to go. But, uh, but since the last time uh, we were here, uh, last time we were we had completed the two green legs leading into panel six, and that's what allowed us to do that closure. And since then, we've continued to move down the east 140, east 140 drift, uh, headed uh, further south into the underground. And so they're they're about right here at this intersection right now, doing bolting. So teams again are making significant headway. They're in contaminated areas uh, of the underground, but they're continuing to make great progress. Uh, if you just calculated all of the area on that on that diagram, we're about 70 percent 
of the area of the underground that needs to be uh, caught up with. We, we've completed that, and we got that on a routine maintenance. So we got about 30% of the area is still to go. Um, we've received our second, our first hybrid bolter. We ordered that uh, about nine months ago. Uh, it was a very long lead item, but that came in about uh, three weeks ago. And uh, we're working through the activities now to, to have it disassembled, taken into the underground, reassembled, uh, train the operators, and put it into service. And we're probably five to six weeks away of putting that into service. The, the, the reason that's important to us is because, as I mentioned, it's hybrid, so it's electric. Um, and, and it won't have diesel emissions. So with our ventilation restraints, it will allow us to do bolting operations in areas where we can otherwise not gain access to because of ventilation. So it's a very significant uh, piece of equipment that, that we're, we're excited to have in our inventory now. Uh, I want to spend just a moment and, and bring you up to speed on the interim ventilation system. Um, I know that when Bob was here uh, last month, he discussed the fact that we were, we were extremely encouraged when, uh, when two trailers showed up with our fan and filter housing units, and that lasted for about three days until we took the covers off and realized that they had been damaged during transport. Um, and so those units have since been moved to the uh, NFT facility here in town, um, and we're using their, their equipment and their facilities. We brought uh, the manufacturers in. They've, they've done the inspections. They'll complete the inspections for the extent of condition uh, reviews tomorrow. And we expect to have a, uh, a draft repair plan by the end of the day tomorrow. Uh, we expect after that's gone through the review and approval cycles, it'll take about two weeks. And the teams will start to actually conduct the repairs on those units. Uh, and if, if, uh, if things go well, we're looking at uh, towards the end of July having those units return to the site. Since then, we've also received ductwork. We've uh, we received seven of 12 shipments of ductwork. Again, we were very excited when they started to show up on all the different trailers. Uh, but again, we were a little disappointed uh, when we did our receipt inspections. We found some issues with some of the welds. Um, and so we brought the vendors back in. They completed their inspections today on the seven of 12 ductwork sections that arrived. Uh, believe that uh, all of those are fairly minor, and they'll be able to do those repairs in the field. But they're continuing to do those assessments, and we've got uh, uh, five more shipments that we're expecting. We currently have those on hold while we work through these uh, weld issues and make sure that we've got a sound quality program. Uh, so a little bit disappointing, but we'll again we'll work through that, uh, and we'll get uh, we'll get the good quality pieces of equipment that we need to install the interventilation system. Now, the civil work has been going on in parallel with all that, and the picture shows uh, the second or the two pads that have been poured that will house the fan and filter units when we get them back on site. There are another 24 pads that have been or uh, well, that will be poured. Uh, 14 of those have been poured to date, and those will be the foundations for all the duct work. Uh, so we'll, we'll look to, to complete all the pouring of those additional pads uh, probably within the next uh, week and a half or so. Uh, now, once we get this IVS system up and running, just as a reminder, this will increase our, our filter capacity from today, which is about 60,000. It'll take us up to about 114,000. So it's a very important piece of uh, equipment for us. Uh, it goes towards our ability to, to resume uh, shipment safely, and, and we're going to continue to work it aggressively, and we'll keep you updated uh, as we move forward. Um, another significant item, you know, we've, we've had this discussion where I've described for you in the past that, uh, that the recovery is made up of really three different elements. It's made up of, of the plant, and that includes all the the equipment and the hardware and the things that we need to do to upgrade the plant. It includes our people and the things that we have to do to train and qualify our folks and, uh, and keep them proficient. And then it includes the, the, the paper, the processes and the procedures 
uh, and the programs that have to be uh, to standard and compliant. And so the safety management programs, um, we've got 18 of them. And uh, in May, we conducted a, an independent uh, line management assessment of each of those. So we conducted 18 different line management assessments. And we evaluated the, the programs and policies and procedures that make up those 18 safety management programs. The reports of those, the results of those uh, uh, inspections are being uh, written up. And uh, next week, uh, myself and Bob will sit down with, with each one of the uh, senior managers in charge of, of, of those individual safety management programs, and they'll take us through the, the results of their, of their assessments. Uh, and that will allow us to benchmark where we are and where we need to go in terms of finishing that. And just as a reminder, you know, these include things like um, our emergency management program that uh, Katie mentioned, uh, it includes, uh, which also includes the EOC and the drill. Um, and just, just to, to sort of uh, build on, on Jeff's comments, we have moved out on, uh, on construction of the Emergency Operations Center that's being done uh, in a portion of the Skeen-Whitlock building. And, uh, and the teams are making good progress on, on outfitting that portion of the building uh, and uh, configuring it for, for operations as, as an emergency operations center. Uh, but it also includes things like our fire protection program, our conduct of ops programs, our maintenance, our work control programs. Uh, and again, it includes our training and qualification programs, all, all, are all separate safety management programs that we're looking at. Um, on zone recovery, uh, there's actually quite a few things going on here. Uh, now that we have finished the, the interim closures of 6 and Room 7, Panel 7, our zone recovery is, is now focusing on several other aspects that are important to uh, the safety envelope and restoring that safety envelope. First, the, uh, the fan reliability. Uh, remember that we have three separate fans. That, uh, that we operate. One, has to, one operates our current uh, filtered system and the other two are standby. We've been doing a lot of work on those standby systems to make sure that uh, their reliability is as high as it can be. And uh, we had some issues with one of them, our 860 Charlie fan, um, with the dampers. And so we, we recently, this week, as a matter of fact, yesterday, we completed uh, some of those maintenance evolutions on those dampers and we've returned that fan to service, so we once again have three fully functional fans uh, for the underground ventilation system. We've also started an, another very important uh, activity. Uh, we've awarded a contract to, uh, to a vendor to, to replace all of the manual fire suppression systems on our, on our diesel equipment in the underground, to replace all those manual systems with automatic fire suppression systems. Um, so all of our mining equipment, which had previously been taken to manual systems, all those are going to now be replaced with automatics. And, and that work has started on the above ground equipment, and uh, they'll be in the underground starting next week. And uh, we expect to do two or three pieces of equipment a week in terms of that, of that upgrade. The electrical work that we're doing, I mentioned to you in the past that we've got 650 or so components that we're going through, inspections, and then cleaning to remove the soot. Uh, we're about 80% done with all of that work, and, and the, the items remaining are in the contaminated areas, uh, and, and they need the bolting uh, to be done to gain access. But uh, the team's making great progress there. Um, and, and then we're, we're restoring a number of our safety systems. Now, the slide talks about two other uh, priorities that we've shifted to. One is. One is combustion, combustible control. We've talked an awful lot about, about the fire event, and we've talked about the fact that, that we're moving our organization to a position where we won't ever have another fire in the underground. But, but if we do, we want to make sure that we've got the strongest response possible. Part of that uh, prevention strategy is to minimize the, the amount of combustible materials in the underground. Um, you know, we take things in the underground with us all the time. We take cardboard boxes in, we take materials, we take tires, we take uh, lubricants, we take fuel. All that stuff goes in the underground 
uh, routinely to support our day-to-day -day operations. But what we've decided is that uh, we're going to carve out and identify an area that is specific, specifically supports our egress. So the salt shaft and the air intake shaft, um, we're going to protect the area around the air intake shaft, obviously because we don't want a fire to occur in that area. Uh, and then we're going to protect the salt shaft and the waste hoist shafts because those are our egress routes. And we're going to, we're going to keep those areas to the maximum extent possible combustion free. We're going to remove all the materials from those areas. Things that have to be in that area, we're going to, we're going to do material substitution. So instead of using a plastic trash can, we're going to go put in a metal trash can. Instead of using a wood pallet, we're going to go buy metal pallets. Uh, so we'll do a number of things uh, to protect those areas by removing combustibles. Now, we're about 80% complete. You know, we pulled out things like tires and wood pallets, as I mentioned. We pulled out cardboard. Uh, we pulled out wooden spools that have uh, electrical and other cables uh, wound up on them, plastic totes and containers. We've simply removed those from the underground, and we're going to continue to do that. We're also putting in place uh, two other controls. One is, uh, in this same area, uh, diesel-fueled equipment can move through the area, but it can't be parked and left unattended in those areas. And so uh, we're going to keep all the diesel-fueled equipment out of those areas unless it's uh, attended. And then finally, we're, we're putting in place at the surface a control mechanism that that evaluates and controls combustibles going into the underground. So in other words, instead of just allowing folks to take with them cardboard boxes full of uh, materials, the, the, uh, at the surface we would stop them, have them remove the materials from the cardboard box, leave the cardboard on the surface, and only take the work materials that they need down in the underground. So we're going to put that kind of a control in place here in the next couple of weeks. The other item that we've talked about uh, and we're making significant progress on and now will become one of our, one of our top priorities going forward is, is our radiological risk reduction. We've talked about this in terms of our decontamination activities and, and our activities to fix contamination. Uh, we're working right now in, in Panel 7. Now that we've got Room 7 isolated, uh, that's a significant radiological inventory now that is isolated and, and protected behind bulkheads. The rest of the panel, we're doing uh, a number of activities to reduce the radiological risk. We've started with, uh, with spray down. We've talked to you. This is a picture of the guy spraying down with handheld uh, instruments. And then we've shown you pictures in the past of the, the gator that we bought that's got the, the tank mounted on the back and has the ability to, to spray uh, both the ribs and the back. Uh, and so what we've done is in rooms, in panel seven, we have, we have done this water application three different times. Uh, and now, as of today, we've got the radiological teams in, and they're, they're doing surveys uh, to measure the effectiveness um, of, of this water spray and, and water application. And we'll continue to do that uh, in panel seven and then move out into the other areas of the underground that are contaminated. We've also uh, tested our approach to, to fix or, or hold contamination uh, and isolate it from our vehicles and our personnel by putting down uh, brattis cloth and a new salt floor over the currently existing contaminated floor. We've tested that. We've, it's been very successful. And uh, starting next week, our teams are going to be going in, and I'm going to flip back to the map just to, to show you exactly what we're going to do. Right now, at South 1950, this is our transition point. Everything to the, to the north, uh, south is considered uh, clean, and our guys are in just normal uh, work clothes, no PPE. Everything to the... I'm sorry, to, to the north. Everything to the south uh, is considered a contamination area, and our guys have to suit up in, in PPE and a, and a respirator or a papper. What the team is going to do is, starting right here at this transition point next week, 
they're going to start to lay down the brattis cloth and the salt, and they're going to build a new floor down East 140 Drift to the South 22, uh, 2520, and then they're going to come all the way down to the West 170. So this, this section right here is going to have a new floor installed. Um, and, and the expectation is, once we've done that, based on the current radiological surveys, we're going to be able to roll that back as an RBA. So today, I mentioned it's a contamination area. Our workers have to go in in PPE and a respirator. Once we've laid the floor down, we'll be able to go in with just PPE without a respirator. And what that'll do is that'll then allow us to move that transition point for the contamination area down here to the entrance of panel 7. And that's when they'll have to put on respirators and to move into panel 7. So again, it's just it's going to roll back the areas. It's going to make it safer. It's going to allow our folks to come out of some of that uh, restrictive PPE um, and it'll give us more access and freer access to, to parts of the facility. Um, and so that was the last bullet. I think the last item I want to talk about. So now I want to shift gears entirely. Uh, day of caring, United Way Day of Caring. Um, we, uh, we had the, the pleasure of, uh, of uh, supporting this activity last year, and, uh, and this year we're supporting it again. Uh, NWP, along with CBFO and, and our subcontractors, as well as a number of the, uh, the companies and organizations and businesses here in Carlsbad, have, uh, have joined together. Tomorrow is the Carlsbad uh, Day of Caring. Um, we've got about 250 volunteers. About 75 of that is coming from NWP and, and CBFO. Uh, and then the, the, the remainder are coming from the other community organizations. Uh, we've got a number of projects that we're going to go out and, and perform for the community. Um, and so I would just uh, I would end on a, on a positive note and just tell you, if you haven't had an opportunity to, uh, to be a part of this uh, activity in the past, if you'd like to come out tomorrow and join us, by all means do that. Uh, it's a great, great way to give back to the community and, and to help a number of our local businesses and, and organizations that, that need help to get things done around their facilities, and they simply don't have the resources or the, the personnel or funding to do that. So uh, I'll end on that note, Dana, and, and uh, turn it back to you or John for questions. and Any closing comments? Okay. Qu questions? Uh, any questions for Dana or Jim? Beverly? Mary. The vent ventilation system <clears throat> that was really the cause of a lot of this problem in the first place was not built correctly or engineered correctly for an, a level two nuclear facility. So what are we doing to make sure that this ventilation system is going to be exactly that for a level two nuclear facility? I thought you were going to take all the questions. Yeah. You told me you were here for us to take all the questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. That's, that's a good question. So, so let, me, um, let me just start by saying the, the ventilation system that, ex that is at WIP um, was built to standard and did perform as it was designed. Now, today as we look at it, um, to today's standards, the, the bypass dampers have uh, had, at the time of the event, had, had a small leak path that today would not be acceptable. Okay, and that's, that's what caused the release. But at the time it was installed, it, it was a compliant system. Now, but, but more importantly to your question, what are we doing about it going forward? I think, as you know, we've, we've sealed those bypass dampers today, and, and we'll that was done with a foam system that was temporary and, and over the next several months we'll be replacing that foamed area with a steel uh, closure mechanism. So, so those, those bypass dampers will be permanently sealed um, going forward in the future. But for our new ventilation systems that we're bringing on, this interim ventilation system that we've talked about, that system is being designed 
to today's standards. And so the vendors have been given uh, all of the quality requirements. They've been given the, the nuclear safety requirements. Um, and, and we will be expecting, all as that unit comes, we expect, and, and we have so far, received all of the appropriate documentation that goes with it to certify that it does meet all of the requirements, codes and standards, and then we'll, we'll install it per the, per the requirements. And then there'll be testing done on it to verify that it actually performs the way that we, we all expect it to perform for a facility of our type. So it's a great question. Um, and I think I can, I can show you, Mary, that we've, you know, with pretty high assurance that we've identified all those requirements and we've made them part of the design packages for this new ventilation system. Who's doing the repair? Now you're having to repair some of this equipment, so these things. Who's doing the repair? Are they qualified to do these repairs? Thank you, Mary. Good, good question. The, uh, yeah, so, so part of, you know, as I just described to you, we, we specified all the requirements, and then we said, as part of our receipt inspection, uh, identified that there was, in, in the case of the fans and the filter units, damage done during transport, and then the ductwork, we've got some quality issue questions on the welds. Uh, so, so the NFT facility in town, is a fully certified NQA1 program, and, and they are going to be doing much of the repair work. Flanders, who was the original manufacturer that assembled all these components and shipped it to us, they also sent their mobile team uh, here to Carlsbad, and they'll be working with NFT in, in their facility. And then, and then the organization that, that NWP contracted with to provide this equipment to us is AECOM, and AECOM has brought in their quality personnel and their nuclear safety personnel to oversee the repair work. And so you've got three, three companies, all with all the pedigree, to, to make the repairs that were, that were done during transport. Because remember, it wasn't, it wasn't that it wasn't fabricated right the first time, it was. It got damaged during transport, and now we've got to make the repairs. So you got those same quality teams that are going to make the repairs here in Carlsbad, and then they'll do all the testing again. They'll repeat all the testing to make sure that it performs and meets the performance standards that it met originally. Okay. So Jim, my question was along the same lines. Um, I know y'all are doing an ask of like 75 to 300 million for from the feds uh, for the new shaft, and um, I was just talking to George about it. So, and I know this is an interim one, but it's going to allow us to open. So, um, and that y'all are still in the, the phase of kind of putting together those numbers for the shaft and that type of thing. Um, so, I'm just curious about the deadline for the numbers. Are you do you have a kind of number? we're looking at because you know or is it going to be ready by September are we going to have to get for the fiscal year 16 17 budget that type of things because it's starting to get pretty um, tough up there in DC getting these these funds and so anyways I'm just curious about the deadline to put the, that uh, that ask together um, and then also um, any estimates on our opening date and then um, with the new ask will that replace this other shaft? Will it just add on to it? And those type of things, or are y'all just looking at all of that? I'm just, we just haven't, I haven't heard that much about that little area for a while, so I'm just kind of curious and, and uh, wh what budget that might be expected to come out of for the, the next year or two. Yeah, so, so let me answer the schedule question first. Um, you know, the current, the current schedule and, and the Secretary's stated goal was March of 2016. Uh, but, but he also made it very clear that we would, we would only resume operations when it was safe to do so. But our current baseline is still working towards that March of 2016 date. Uh, and we're evaluating, you know, things like the delay that this IVS, the interim ventilation, we're looking at what impacts that might have. But, but right now we're still working to that baseline 
of March 2016. Now, in terms of the line item uh, capital projects, uh, we're still we're still you know that we follow the CD process, the critical decision process that that DOE lays out, and that goes from CD zero to CD four, critical decision zero to critical decision four. We we've gotten critical decision zero uh, approved, and that was done I think last September, and that and that basically just said here's the need, and now now what we're doing is we've We've, we're doing the conceptual design report, meaning we, we've um, come up with two or three uh, design options, and the teams are, are fleshing out the actual designs and the associated cost ranges associated with those designs. And, uh, and we'll be giving those to the department. Um, in fact, I think we've already transmitted well, I guess we're, we're going to transmit tomorrow, June 5th. We're going to transmit those to the department, and then the department has to follow its its process of uh, of reviews and approvals. And so, again, I don't I don't know if I have at this point a date in mind when we might have a a number to to center on, but because that's really back to your board. Right, right now. Uh, we are assuring that the latest standards and requirements are being implemented. Um, among other things, that's caused us to add some requirements into our original baseline that we're evaluating right now. But uh, one of those um, additional standards addressed uh, new requirements for the critical decision process. And we're in the process of, of trying to uh, pull those requirements back and, and expedite the process. So we're, we're working internally at, at uh, that, and when we receive the, the product, we'll be moving forward with that. In fact, I was out at the site, and we had uh, a team that was going to do an independent uh, alternatives analysis on that that were uh, getting prepped and up to speed on that. So. Okay, I'm, I've got uh, six questions presently, and I think some of these are pretty straightforward. Uh, this is, for Mr. Bryson, this is a question for you. At this point, what do you perceive to be the most challenging task prior to resumption of receiving waste? The most challenging task. It, it's, it's hard to isolate that to one task. Um, we've, we've got a number of different areas that we're proceeding on that are prerequisites to receiving waste. So Jim talked to you about decontamination and, and laying down the what the workers are calling the yellow brick road uh, that will allow them to bring the waste into panel 7 where they can transition it to um, um, people that are working in the contaminated area. So that that is key and that you know a year ago that seemed to be one of the most daunting things. How are we going to make that work? And now the workers are getting involved and they're they're filling in the details. So that that is kind of coming together and and I I think going well so far. Um, another area is the uh, safety analysis, uh, what Mary was so concerned about. How do we assure that, that we have the controls and requirements in place for our hazard category two nuclear facility that happens to be half a mile underground? Uh, that, that is proceeding. We've uh, implemented the latest requirements for a document safety analysis, and they're going through the calculations and coming up with the controls. That is really uh, one of our critical paths right now, and so uh, that's a challenge. Um, we've got our safety management programs that when we had this emergency, uh, we, we uh, lacked confidence in those programs and our work control processes and caused us to pull our controls back 
and, and really uh, do case-by-case -case approval of work. And now those are coming together, as Jim said, and we're getting them validated and in place. And, and some of the key pieces there that are, are very critical, uh, as Katie mentioned, was emergency management. And, you know, so that's the level of controls that we're dealing with there. And, and so far, those are, are coming together pretty well. Uh, they're not on the critical path, but they're close to the critical path. And, and so we've got a wide range of activities that everything has to come together in order to make it work. And, and right now, the critical path is the, uh, the safety analysis and the uh, determination of controls. Thank you. Uh, why didn't NWP inspect the welds in the ductwork at the manufacturing sites? Actually, when you do a nuclear quality uh, procurement like this, you do have a uh, QA plan that requires you to identify key critical elements that you inspect in the shop as it's being made. That was implemented. Um, DOE then added on to that plan with inspection of um, specific elements within that. So that was done, and the elements that were inspected were verified to be adequate. What happened with our first shipment was it appears that it was done correctly, and then we had damage in shipping. What's happened with the uh, ducting that we just received is it appears to be a combination of, of possible shipping damage, but also improperly done in the shop. And so we're looking into why our QA uh, plan didn't uh, find that. Continue? OK. Thank you. Um, do we have a, OK. This has been asked before, but it, uh, do, you, do you have plans to have a safe room in the underground as part of your safety program? A safe room, and and what we're doing is is, um, and this is actually in our incentives uh, with NWP, is that we will will have uh, structures in the underground where people can survive um, with uh, supplied air, and um, we're we're in the process of procuring them right now, right, Jim? We're going, to, we're going to procure a number of refuge chambers and place those in, in strategic locations. And as Dana mentioned, those will have electrical and communications and, and ventilation. And it's, a, it's very common in the mining industry now to have safe harbor facilities within the mine. How are we going to get any radiological data from inside the mine. We've been asking for that, I think, since January. Uh, readings, data, something to tell us what the radiological uh, readings are down there. My understanding is that we've provided that to people that have asked for it. Uh, if um, there's a concern uh, in general, we can put it on our web page as well. Would you like that, Mary? I'd like that. I thought we might be going over it you know, at the meetings at some point. <laughs> well, actually, uh, Jim has gone over it in general in just showing what's a contamination area versus a uh, RBA versus a high contamination area. So if you look at the map that he provided, a contamination area is uh, between 20 uh, disintegrations per minute alpha to 2,000 disintegrations per minute alpha. And then a high contamination area is above the 2,000 disintegrations per minute alpha. And so the whole purpose of the uh, decontamination effort 
is to try and take, as Jim said, that high uh, contamination area down into a contamination area and then to uh, release some of the contamination area into um, an RBA. That's a radiological buffer area. There just seem to be <clears throat> a lot of questions from most of us that aren't quite knowledgeable about all this. <clears throat> we want to know. We want some numbers. I guess. I guess we want one number about the whole place, which is not possible. So. Well, there, there are numbers in zones. Yeah. And, and we have, we've we've released it to people that have asked that question. We'll we'll put it on the website. Yeah, we'll put and it on the website. We've actually been showing that map for several months now. Yeah. I have three more, but they're pretty quick ones. Are you okay with going, Pat? We've, they're pretty. Um, this is sort of a follow-up to what we were just talking about about the radiation survey done in panel seven being made public. Is is that the same answer? Is that yes. Okay. <laughs> Easy one. Um, another, another yes or no. Are radiation readings being taken on the outward side of the HIPAA filters before the air is released into the environment? We, we have readings being taken before the HEPA filters and readings being taken after it's gone past the HEPA filters. And, and you'll see that on our website as Station A, that's before the filters and station B, which is after the filter. This is not a yes or no, but this is kind of a, a looking back type question. Um, and regarding the um, combustible safety zones, so the, the moving out the wooden crates and, and so forth, I guess there's a question why that wasn't done before. I know that's a hard one to answer, but was, was that, what caused that change or why, why wasn't that implemented years before? That's, that's a, really a matter of priorities. Our, our priorities, uh, while once we got back into the mine, was to make the mine safe from, from ground control, from, from basic mining hazards. And so we've been focusing on the uh, bolting efforts and then on isolating the nitrate wastes uh, as directed by NMED. And so that, that resulted in our uh, putting up the bulkheads. And, and so those have been key focuses. And keep in mind that until we got the waste hoist in operation, we were limited to 24 people in the underground. I think they're asking a little historical in terms of before the incident, why, why, that, had, why that was an issue, why five years ago, 10 years ago, that, that wasn't addressed. My response to that is, that would have been good. We didn't do it. We should have. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Beverly left because I, you know, when we're talking about the the delays of the process, I think really, from my perspective, one of one of the long poles in the tent is the critical decision making process, and it is agonizingly slow, and especially in view of the fact that the things we're thinking about and have done, we've done them all before. We've done, we've done drifts, we've done shafts, we've done filter systems, we've done safety systems. So all of these things could be done concurrently, and they are being done concurrently as much as they can be, but in the critical decision-making process, you really need funding to get some of the long lead items purchased, you need to get funding to get uh, the the process put in place, and and until somehow that gets explained and gets all done concurrently, I think it could lead to this long-term opening that we've been talking about. People begin to talk about 2019 now, instead of you know the end of 2017 or mid 27 or early 18 in terms of calendar years. So that is a long pole in the tent. <laughs> So with that, 
I won't ask anybody to respond to that, but that's kind of an observation of mine. But um, at any rate, uh, we thank all of you for coming tonight, especially Secretary Flynn, Jeff, Katie, thank you so much for being here. Catherine, thank you for being here. We appreciate that, Diane. And uh, uh, those online, we appreciate you as well. And so we'll, uh, we'll be adjourned. Oh, Diane, you want to make a comment? in Albuquerque on June 15th, I believe, and they will be at the Marriott or, or the uh, Embassy Suites, and there will be two, two hearing periods, one I think beginning at 5 and one beginning maybe at 2, and then there's the one in Carlsbad on the 16th. So hope everybody will come out and listen to those, make comments if you have them. So with that, thank you all very much again for being here.